Good morning. Good morning. Good day to be in the house of the Lord today. Amen. <clears throat> Please pardon me and forgive me if I uh, sound a little not as loud as usual. It's uh, still coming over a bit of uh, allergies and congestion myself, so hoping that won't affect too much of the message today. Uh, oh, yeah. There we go. So. Where we're going to be at today is going to be in Philippians chapter 2 at the very start, for those who at least want to turn there. And the topic of the sermon is regarding the idea of humility and humbleness and having it being Christ-centered and having it being something that is aimed at imitating our Lord and Savior. And it is because of that that we should adopt this, not just simply because it would be considered a good thing, but rather that it is submission and reverence to our Lord himself. And so with that, we're going to get into what the Apostle Paul teaches and states in his epistle and letter to the church in Philippi. And with that, we will get into the reading of the word, then we will exegete the word, and then show how to apply it in our day and life. So, starting in Philippians chapter 2, in verse 1, if y'all are there. We begin with the following. Verse 1. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility Consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If y'all will, let's bow our heads and pray for the reading of the word of God. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and are very grateful to be reading your word, to be studying your word, and to be hearing and expounding upon your word, Lord. Please ask that I ask that you deliver the message through your spirit, Lord, that it would not be the words of the wisdom of men that are ultimately gathered upon, but rather the wisdom and the treasures that are in heaven from you, Lord. We ask that you bless us, that you may sanctify us and edify us with the teaching of your word. And we thank you for your son, Jesus, who came to this world to die for our sins, Lord. And it is in his holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, starting with the very first two verses, what we're going to get into is a very interesting preface into how the Apostle Paul tries to describe what we should try to do and how this hum- this humbleness, this humility um, is upon us. And that is, if then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, if there is any of this involved, notice what he says at the very beginning before trying to go into all of these if anys, is that if there is any encouragement in Christ. So we should have the forms of encouragement centered into Christ. We should have our notions of love and the consolation of love rooted after Christ. We should have the fellowship with the Spirit rooted after our Lord and Savior, Jesus. If there's any affection and mercy, it must reflect the same kind of affection and the same kind of mercy that Jesus displayed, especially upon the cross. And so we need to have this focus because as verse 2 says, make my joy, the Apostle Paul wanting to have some form of joy, saying it to be completed by thinking the same way as was repeated in verse 1, that they have to think this same way. Think the same way, not just of what was just stated in the verse, but mostly thinking the same way in Christ as Christ did. For as he says, having the same love, 
united in spirit, intent on one purpose. And with this one purpose, we must ask then, what does that mean? For, for the Christians that are under the new covenant, that are part of the church, this one purpose that we are supposed to be united in and intent upon is in the notion of the teaching of the gospel, to spread the notion and not just spread and teach it, but to live that very notion itself of Christ coming into this world. He died for our sins because, as the verse says, he loved the world in this way. He had this big affection, this big grace and mercy and love that he came into this world, not to make himself simply be boasted or bragged, as we will see later on to the passage, but rather to show that humbleness that he has in that love of what he was willing to do for that. And so we should adopt that same kind of notion to have that same sense of love, of grace and mercy. For as verse three states, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others as more important than yourselves. Now, some people are not gonna like this particular notion because you have some people who want to live their lives out. They want to do everything for themselves. They want to live these hedonistic lifestyles. That is the lifestyle that is truly selfish, just fulfilling all their desires, all their carnality. They want to eat everything that they want and not try to share that with other people. They want to get as much money as they can and just spend it mostly on themselves, not spending it out on other people. These people become absorbed with themselves to the point that they are selfish and full of selfish ambition and conceit. But however, when one practices the notion of humility, considering others as more important than yourselves, then that's a hard task. And it's a difficult thing, I believe, not just simply for America, but even for even the church as a whole, all around the world, will have a problem with. Because, I mean, we do like to try to do things for ourselves sometimes. That is just how man is rooted from their original state. But however, notice what it says that we should do this. And then verse four, everyone should look out not only for his own interest. So it's not saying ultimately, don't like take care of yourself occasionally with like some medicine if you get sick or something, you know, you gotta spend something like that to take care of your health and everything. But it says not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. So in other words, do make sure that, you know, you're feeling right, but consider others being more important in how they should be taken care of than even your own self. There are several people that I know that have gone through this um, particular notion, but uh, the one that I will try to tell that was of an interesting story, and I'm glad the results of it turned out well, was that one day when I was uh, working at one of my jobs, we stopped at a uh, GameStop, and then there was this guy who said he hopped a train trying to look for work, and he was also trying to find the Salvation Army, and apparently the shelter at that time was closed for whatever particular reason. But he was just simply asking me and telling me, you know, where to point out for a job, because he's not asking money out of me. But he's been, he, got a, he had a gash that was all on the arm, that was clearly infected, and he was just simply asking where he could find some work. He wasn't asking for a hospital, he wasn't asking for any handouts. He just said, where can I go do you know that is hiring? And I told him where to go, but at the same time, I decided to give him um, during that time about $30 just to see if, you know, it would help out. I mean, I was going to use that eventually for some food that day, but I figured that he needed it more than I did. And I figured that that's probably where it was going to be. You know, that's why I did that, that that was the last time I was going to see him. Well, the Lord brings everything for a reason as I ended up meeting him again, this time in a wheelchair. And he was trying uh, to still do the same thing, just looking for a job, not asking for any handouts. And so one day I decided, I don't know what it was that come over me, but, you know, he said he was hungry and he just, you know, needed work at first to just get something. So I said, how about this? You take the wheelchair, I'll put it in the back of my car and I'm going to buy you some uh, lunch and I'm going to also buy you some dinner, you know, get something to at least sustain you for the day. Because I was also on my way to work and I was risking being late at that point, um, which I was going to eventually get a um, bit of an argument from my boss at that point. But we went and I went to taking a Burger King and I spent at least like 
several dollars on a several burgers and a decent meal for lunch that cost it around like 10 12 dollars and i just told him you know you you know eat what you have here and then the rest you know take for yourself have it as a snack if you're trying to get a job and everything i admire that and but i want you to at least have a good life and to have some decent health and he tried even to get some of the money or try to find a way to pay me back or even give me some of the food i'm just you need it more than I do right now. And eventually what I found out after that encounter, I, like I said, I thought this was going to be the last time as well. But then I ended up meeting him about four months later. The gash on his arm had been healed completely. He was no longer in a wheelchair or needing crutches, but rather he ended up seeing me at a gas station at around 1130 at night and talked about that, how he found another friend. He got him a job, he's making a steady income, and finally was able to buy himself a house. So, it's things like that people ask, well, if you try to just help out other people and put them above yourself, then what does that bring forth apart from leaving you out of money or leaving you without some of this happiness or something like that? Well, it's the things like that and shows the grace and the mercy that can be had is that when we help out other people, in that same kind of sense, not just simply the homeless, but also even to our own children, our own family, our own friends, the way that we carry ourselves out. The Bible says that we are to be a light unto the world. And when we act as that light, we are not just simply saying we are glowing, but rather we are reflecting only just a small portion of the same kind of light, of the same kind of love, of the same kind of grace that our Lord Jesus Christ had displayed on the cross and how he carried himself out in his ministry. And then the Apostle Paul gets into verse 5, where then eventually we're going to get into what is, from what I found out, is actually an old Christian hymn that actually even predated the conversion of Paul to Christianity. And because of this, we see a very interesting outlook into shortly once the church was formed, how then was the music reflected and how the theology was reflected in the very start of the preaching of Christ during the, during the apostles' time, in which we see the statement before the song, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. And then he gets into it in verse 6 regarding this hymn and what it teaches, who existing in the form of God, the literal translation being who being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited, meaning that he wasn't trying to use the notion, because we all affirm, and the scriptures do themselves teach, that Jesus is not just a mere man, and Jesus is not just a mere prophet, but Jesus is God himself, the second person of the Trinity. And so, while being in the form of God, he did not consider this notion of being God to be something that was just to be rampaged and just exploited upon every single particular time because we see the four gospels and we see mostly the teachings about repentance the teaching of what happens when those uh reject the gospel and they end up in hell jesus talks about hell more than anyone in the whole of the new testament we see him talking about all of these things and only occasionally do we find verses where he indicates his own divinity because he's not trying to see it as something to be exploited or being something to brag about. Because verse 7, instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. Because remember, if Jesus is God, God is also, we have to remember, eternal. And so Jesus also existed before even the creation of the world. And at one point in time, when the incarnation occurs with Jesus coming down through the virgin birth, we see what was the result. It says that he decided to empty himself by taking upon the form of a servant, which, by the way, is prophesied in the book of Isaiah, that he would come in the form of a servant, the Messiah would. And we see this with Jesus coming in this form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. So Jesus is taking upon a form similar to ours, and as the holy and most just God who is omni in all the attributes. He was at a point where he would be able to be weak. He was 
able to be hungry. He was able to thirst. He was able to live in the way that we do today and in the past. And what happens here, it says, and when he had become a man, had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Jesus comes in and is being obedient um, in trying to do the will of the Father, to try to redeem his people, and to carry out the message, and even to the point of every single prophecy that must be fulfilled, and as it states, even to death on a cross. Again, also prophesies in Isaiah and everywhere else in Scripture where it says that Jesus, the Messiah, must die, but it even more focuses on the notion of dying on a cross as an atoning sacrifice for our sins that we have. And so he did this, being humble towards it. In fact, even to the point that when he had a chance to get free, when Peter tried uh, to cut off the ear of one of the soldiers and told Jesus to flee, run, get away from here. Jesus said, put away your sword. For are you to take the cup that has been given unto me by the Father? Jesus had a chance to get out of that. But notice, being humble and knowing that he had to be obedient to the point of death took on the notion willingly that road that was going to lead him to his death to the cross. Peter tried to help, but yet Jesus refused because he knew and had to do something. And that was to be obedient to the will of the Father and to humble himself and not see himself as something highly. And then verse 9, we read, For this reason, meaning that everything we've just read, that Jesus being in the form of God, not considering himself, not considering equality with God, something to be exploited, but being humble and taking upon the servant, he says, for this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every other name. It's above every other name in this room. It's above every other name that is outside the room. It's above every name in America. It's above every name in China. It's above every name in the entirety of the world. The name that is above every name. Not just some names, not just 50% of names, not just... A quarter of names, but every name. And so that at the name of Jesus, the name that again is higher than every other name, above every other name, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So we see here that we have this verse and we're going to get into one particular uh, mention of this that I will try to refute uh, that some people have misconceptions of because it says every knee is going to bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Some people will read this and say every knee is going to bow in heaven and on earth and every, and, and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I mean, the, the, there's the verse that says that, you know, whoever confesses that Jesus is Lord is to be saved. So this means everyone's going to be saved. Except I mean, we already have the scripture that talk about the notion of hell. Now, what this talks about here is that, because again, note, it says in heaven and on earth. And then it says under the earth. And this notion would refer to the notion of hell. And clearly not even, we wouldn't even say that demons are going to be saved. We wouldn't say that those who are in hell uh, are going to eventually be redeemed and saved out from there. Because the Bible already says that that punishment is eternal. But what it is referring to is that they will simply remember and know that Jesus is indeed Lord, as we've clearly established. And what verse 11 says, that they confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And there's even the Bible verse that says... For even the demons know God. They do not deny the existence of God. They do not deny the supremacy and the lordship of Christ. But in fact, even doing so, they tremble in fear. Even the demons fear Jesus in his very presence. So it's not saying anything about that everyone that is under this will be saved. Though some will certainly be saved um, on earth if they repent of their sins and put their faith and trust in Christ as Lord and Savior. 
but that everyone will acknowledge that Jesus has that name that is above every other name, that he is the sovereign Lord, that he has ruling over everything just as the Father does. But every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because we already have in Romans 1 the teaching that everyone knows God exists so that, as the Bible says, they are without excuse. Even the so-called atheists. But even as it says that eventually, when Christ returns, we will have every knee bowing in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And they will confess that Jesus is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, there's always that important distinction to remember that Jesus is not, again, doing this all for himself. Because remember, we have that already established from how we are to then imitate Christ in verses 1 through 4. And then the earlier part of this hymn where it talks about that he did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself and assumed the form of a servant. Jesus submits to the will of the Father. That is a core element of the Trinitarian notion of God. That Jesus, while being God, he is not just working on his own. He's not just going solo. He's not like some guy in a rock band that decided, well, I know this band was doing all good. I'm going to go my own way and make all this kind of money and get my name kind of up there. No. He submitted himself so that the will of God and that the glory of God the Father will be made known through the second person, through Jesus Christ, through the Son. And so with that, what we have here in these verses is, number one, through verses one through two that we established, that we are to be united in love and unity for the gospel. Not just one person trying to reflect this, but the entirety of the church. This is a command for you. Not just the church here, but the church as a whole. Because the church is not just a building you go to. The church is the body of Christ. What, what we gather in is what's called the visible church. And then there's what's called the invisible church. That is, that is, if you want to put an analogy to it, think of it like the whole world is just wrapped up in this gigantic gigantic, unseeable kind of like church building. And then all the Christians that are in it are partakers and members of that. We're all in the same body. We may have some that are serving as the arms, serving as the left arm, some serving as the legs, however you want to view it. We are all in the same body of Christ. We are all in the same church. We are all in the same new covenant that was established when Christ died on that cross and took away our sin debt. And then in verses 3 through 4, we have to be united in love and unity for the gospel. But notice that verse 3 to 4, consider ourselves lesser than others and to try to put their needs and helping them out above our own selfish ambitions and our own conceit. And in fact, it's a good time that we have uh, this being preached during this particular month because Christmas is coming up and we give during this particular time, not because out of a competition contest, though some will try to do so. We do not give simply so that we can receive a, a relative's love higher than every other in the family by becoming the favorite. But rather, we give because that is essentially what the Bible tells us to do, to be a cheerful giver and to consider ourselves not doing anything out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, we should look not only for our own interests, but the interests of others and appreciate and help out others. So when we give gifts, keep in mind for this season that it is the giving of gifts for the point and the purpose of showing and demonstrating not just simply the love we have for our family, not just simply the love we even have for friends. If you give your friends or your co-workers some gifts, but it even shows what is essentially that notion that we reflect just a little small bit, a little tiny bit of that gift and that kind of grace that we have in God. After all, we are made in the image of God. We act in a similar notion, but only to a small portion, a small fraction of what God does. And the kind of gift that God gave us, apart from what we usually celebrate on Christmas being the birth of the Messiah, being Jesus himself incarnate, is then eventually, years and years later, the crucifixion 
for the atonement and then eventually the resurrection that showed that Jesus didn't just simply die and stay dead, but rather that he conquered death. And as a result of both of these things, gave us the greatest gift that we could have. And that is redemption. That is salvation. That is atonement for our sin debt that he took upon himself so that we would not have to perish but we have the opportunity to be reconciled with our Heavenly Father by repenting of our sins and accepting the gift that Christ has given. And by that, we take upon the notion of putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, not just simply as Lord, but as our Savior as well. Amen. And so with that, that is what is very interesting about these particular things. We've only just gone over the core elements of just the first four verses. Verses 5 through 11, again. It's an old Christian hymn where before he goes into it, it says, adopt the same attitude, the same lifestyle, the same mindset, the same mentality as that of Christ Jesus. And he explains how by talking about while being in the form of God, he did not consider that to be something to exploit or brag about or boast about, but rather that he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and taking on the likeness of humanity. And then he humbled himself by even becoming obedient to the point of death itself on the cross. And so that eventually every knee, every tongue will bow and confess that not just Jesus is simply the Savior, but that Jesus is Lord. So that we recognize that he is being in the form of God, but he's not trying to boast or brag about it. But even at that point, while being humble, people are still going to recognize him. People are still going to recognize that he's not just a mere man. They're going to see the glory that he has, the glory that he had with the Father before we were even created, before Adam and Eve were even created, before the whole world was created. This same glory that will have every knee bowing and have every tongue confessing that Jesus is Lord, that he has the name above every other name on the whole world and in the whole of this universe. And in fact, one of the other reasons why we need to adopt this lifestyle, because some people may say, well, I want to live my own way because I think that'd just be better. I mean, I want to go to a bar and just get completely drunk and wasted. Or, you know, I just want to eat everything I want. I ain't sharing none of that when it comes to the Thanksgiving or the Christmas uh, family dinners. That food is all mine. Why should I even try to share any of that? Why should I adopt this? Well, the main thing, and it's actually funny enough that... Uh, the week before I was going to preach this, uh, Mama Roger actually managed to uh, touch upon something that actually was very close to what I was going to try to mention in this sermon. And that is in Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 9. He talks about, for my thoughts. Now, this is God speaking here, the Lord. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. So what we have here is what... Uh, very interesting thing I've learned about from a philosopher by the name of Cornelius Van Til talks about what we have is called the creator creature distinction. That is that remember that God is above every other name on here and that his ways and his thoughts are not like ours. So God is distinct from the creation and he is the creator who created everything. And so we have to note that his ways are not like ours at all. But instead, as verse 9 says, for as heaven is higher than the earth, not just in terms of if you look up, it's like, oh, yeah, it, it is kind of higher up, uh, up there compared to where we are. It's that it is higher in the terms of what it is like. For as it even says, so my ways are higher than your ways and then my thoughts than your thoughts. This may step on some toes on some people, but regarding the way that it is taught, I mean, we have to understand that God is so transcendent, so omnipresent and all knowing in everything else. That even the Bible states that if God could have wanted to, he could have just ended our lives just right there, punished us for our sin at that point. But as even the Bible says, he is patient and eventually the moment when Jesus Christ comes into this world for the very purpose, for the very mission that was to be promised, that the sin debt that we accumulated over a period of time would be paid off for on the cross. 
So it just shows you, again, even that same humility, God could have done anything to show off his glory. As the Bible even says, he has that ability and that right to do so because he is higher than us. He is better than us in everything that we do. Like usually one thing that I ask when people try to bring up an objection, say, I am better than your God. I say, all right, then can you make me something out of nothing? Like, what? Like I said, can you make me something out of nothing? You can't use any materials. You can't use any pencils. You can't use any sort of artistic uh, crafting that you may use in home ec. Go ahead and create something from nothing, please. They usually become silent on that part, or they try to still go into the mocking sense. Like, well, clearly I'm not, I can't do that. I'm like, oh, clearly you've proven my point. Because the point is that God is greater than us and higher than us, and that our ways and our thoughts are not his ways. So when we think uh, being selfish, we have to consider that this is the flesh speaking. This is the carnal world part of us that was the old man that the Bible talks about. That is it speaking and not the way of the spirit, which says that we need to reflect and imitate Christ. For even the apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, and with Regarding what he says, some may think it's an oxymoron with what he's trying to relay, because he says, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Now, he's not trying to say, I'm the standard. Everyone be like me, because even himself, he called himself the chief of sinners. But ultimately, what he's saying in that verse is that we need to be imitators of Christ. And when he points to himself, say, be imitators of me as I am in Christ. So he's trying to go down the chain of line. And again, remember, the Bible says we are to be a light unto the world. Paul is demonstrating that by saying and showing that he is imitating the style of Christ. And that's ultimately where his lifestyle and where he's reflecting his teachings and ideas and how he acts and he behaves is ultimately from. So we are to adopt ultimately, not simply imitating Paul or Peter or John or any of these other people when we read their epistles, but rather we are to imitate Christ, ultimately, and how he demonstrated himself on this world during his earthly ministry, even to the point of how he carried himself when it came to the point of death upon the cross. Even his final prayer that he states that, Lord, Lord, forgive them for they know not what they do. Even when having rocks thrown at him, having a crown of thorns pierced into his head, when having him, his hands and his feet nailed to the cross, he still said the words, forgive them, forgive these people, for they do not know what they're doing. Amen. And that takes a lot of guts, especially with the teachings and the Sermon on the Mount where it says, where it says eye for an eye, but I say unto you, turn the other cheek. And all the, because it goes into more than just simply a turn the other cheek. It even talks about, you know, if a, uh, the idea of giving a, your coat to someone, like a lot of notions of being kind even unto our enemies by showing and demonstrating the same grace and the mercy that Christ displayed. And we adopt that into our lives. Whereas my stepmom and my dad had also taught me that, you know, be just like Jesus, try to reflect as much as he can because you might be the only Bible that these people ever read. Because sometimes you're going to try to preach the gospel. You're going to say what the words say in the Bible. But sometimes they may not even try to listen or focus into that. Sometimes they might not even try to take on your invitation to go to church. But if you can show that reflection of the gospel, that reflection of Christ, your Savior, in you, and demonstrate it by being a light into the world, can start bringing in some questions. People start asking and talking. You know, it's very interesting that you do this. Why do you do this? It's even to the point that I try to practice um, one form of the humility by accepting that I don't even deserve the salvation of God, the salvation of Christ. Because sometimes I'm going to the Walmart or something like that, and someone asks, uh, "How are you doing today?" I say, "Better than I deserve." It's like, well, what, does, what does that mean? You know, don't be down on yourself like that. Well, I am a I am a sinner who deserves the wrath of God, but yet by his grace, here I am and I am saved and redeemed as a child of God. Just a casual conversation, just because someone asks, how are you doing today? And they're like, hmm, I never thought of it that way. 
And so they usually, sometimes they'll thank me for it. Sometimes they just miss Pat, go by it. But you never know. Even simple statements like that and the humility and the humbleness you accept can do so much. And I'll point out this one last deal um, from Gordon Fee, a biblical scholar, a music team, if y'all would like to uh, go ahead and make y'all's way up here for this. Uh, we're during... He, com he comments on this particular passage of verses 5 through 11, specifically, the, the Christian hymn that we discussed. And Gordon Feed notes a very interesting, significant element in his commentary of the epistle. And he says, For in pouring himself out and humbling himself to death on the cross, Christ Jesus has revealed the character of God himself. Here is the epitome of God-likeness. The pre-existent Christ was not a grasping, selfish being, but one whose love for others found its consummate expression in pouring himself out, in taking the role of a slave, in humbling himself to the point of death on behalf of those so loved. No wonder Paul cannot abide triumphalism, for as it says, it goes against everything God is and everything God is about. <laughs>